All right, we're, this is Mike Graham. We're gonna let a few of you more get let in from the waiting room before we get started with this afternoon's festivities. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read the etiquette protocols for the Zoom defenses so that everyone's clear beforehand. Um, all of you as audience participants are supposed to stay muted throughout the defense. Please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. And at the very end of the talk, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions um, after the defense. That'll be moderated by myself. So um, I'll be able to um, basically use the raise, raise the hand feature and I'll be able to call on you and moderate the questions for Ann. Um, and then when we're all done, I'm gonna allow everyone to basically unmute and give a, a hoop and holler um, for, uh, for Anne as we congratulate her and then move on to her defense committee meeting, in which case I'll need Tom and Diana to stay on as well. <clears throat> so I think we're doing pretty good in getting the attendees into the meeting room. So I am gonna go ahead and start with a couple of comments about Anne. Um, as you all know, she is probably the most colorful individual in the beer pigs, um, both uh, emotionally and physically. She brings uh, vibrance to everything she does, which is I think why there are so many people from so many different aspects of Moss Landing who are tuning into today's talk. She came to us um, from Colorado State University. She finished in 2013, had an amazing academic credential. Um, I won't say her GPA because it makes me feel bad how good it was um, relative to my own undergraduate GPA, but Anne did extremely well during undergrad, had a lot of wonderful experiences. And it was actually fun looking at all the classes she took um, because uh, it's not all science. There was a lot of fun stuff Anne got to take while she was in, in undergrad. She came here in fall of 2016 uh, to work with Diana Steller and I um, on projects. And as you guys know, Diana was down in Catalina a lot. And so um, Anne got the opportunity to work with her and get started on her thesis. And along the way, she took the Baja class um, with a variety of professors, including Scott and Hamilton and Diana Steller. She took the Chile class with Scott and I. Um, and she, she's taken a lot of other courses at Moss Landing, including my seaweeds course, which she did so well in, I ultimately made her come back and TA it. So she had the opportunity to, to help encourage a, a new cohort of, of beer pig um, phycologists. So I'm very proud that Anne was able to put that major contribution into our laboratory. The time she spent in Catalina, she was actually extremely productive and she, um, she got the Wrigley Fellowship <clears throat> which was a fellowship that allowed her to work down there during the summers. And there was a lot of interpretive work where she had to give presentations and, and, and be involved with that program. So that was great for her. I know it helped her out both financially and with her experiences down there. She won um, various awards, including, you know, the wave awards here at Moss Landing. She made a presentation um, for the society of the preservation of natural history collections out in Chicago, which is a very um, interesting opportunity for her to talk about not just her thesis, but about, um, you know, the other things she loves, which you're going to hear about in a, in a little bit. She also gave a talk at the Western Society of Naturalists, um, and she got an internship at the Monterey Bay Aquarium while she was here at Moss Landing, working on their herbarium, which ultimately ended up in a publication for the aquarium. So I think she did a lot of great work there and was well appreciated, so much so that she came over to Moss Landing and decided to clean up our herbarium. Um, and she was funded by the College of Science to do so and had a lot of work with Katie Lage. And, and, and thank you, Yvonne Oaiello, if you're able to make the talk. I knew you and Jim Harvey worked really hard to get her some additional funding to support that program. And as you can see, when you get to see Anne, she's sitting in our museum, which she's been kind of the caretaker of for quite a bit of time. And so we're very proud of that. And it got her a job, like a real honest to goodness job. Anne is leaving next week for the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecolo Ecological Restoration, where she's got a job for at least two years um, and potentially longer pending funding to work with their marine herbarium there. So um, she's you know, moving on to a bigger school with a, a bigger program and, and she gets to do outreach and kind of basically teach people about seaweeds, um, which is really exciting for us as an educational 
facility to have a student who's going to go on um, and immediately make an impact on what people do with seaweeds and how they think about them. So we're very excited. Um, and and that leads us to today, you know, to, to hear what Anne's been doing these last few years um, down in Catalina. And uh, we're, I'm excited to just, you know, give you her, the topic of her title or topic of her conversation, sorry, topic of her presentation, which is feeling the heat, reproductive competition between Macrocystis pyrifera and Sargassum horneri. Take it away, Ann Bishop. Mike, thank you for that excellent introduction. And I'm excited to share with you uh, all the stuff I've been doing on Catalina, uh, not just uh, for the past few years, but also a little bit of my experience when I was down there uh, before coming to Moss Landing. So to begin with, I'm gonna give you some background on um, some of the issues around uh, these two species before we dive into what actually I did on the island and, and what things look like. And then we'll get into the results and discussion. And at the end, I have some really important acknowledgements for a lot of the, the folks that helped contribute to this project. So to begin with, to provide some context, um, I'm gonna talk about climate change. Um, as we know, climate change is a global issue that is gonna change the way the world looks in a lot of different ways. Uh, looking at this diagram on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the first two globes uh, are the conditions we expect to see today. So medium temperatures, um, kind of a temp uh, temperate precipitation pattern. And then by the end of the century, it's supposed to get a lot hotter and places that are really wet are going to get wetter. Places that are drier are going to get drier. So we're facing a very different uh, climate in the future. However, these uh, dynamics will be different across the globe. And so local regions need to understand how climate effects will interface with um, local habitat disturbances to understand how to best manage our natural resources. We can already see uh, where this is happening in terrestrial uh, habitats, for example, in forests across the Western United States, we're seeing that climate change um, and patterns like heat waves and droughts are already resulting in higher temperatures and drier summers. These ultimately can contribute to wildfires burning hotter and longer. And that combined with things like habitat destruction as, and invasive grasses can lead to it being more difficult for these forests to return to the state we expect to see. Um, and so invasive species are playing a huge role with climate change in shaping our landscapes of the future. So what is an invasive species? Well, first you have to know what a native species is. A native species is an organism that originated through natural or evolutionary means in a location and is an integral part of the ecosystem where it thrives and plays a particular role. While an invasive species such as fennel is non-native and was introduced through human or anthropomorphic means and it has the potential to cause ecologic or economic harm. Um, while we are still trying to predict the effects of climate change, one thing that does give us a proxy to understand how organisms react in the short term to increased heat are, fact, are events like El Nino. Um, El Nino features heavily in this talk, and the main thing you need to know about El Nino is that during a normal year, El Nino means in a non-El Nino year, um, hot water is typically being pushed towards Australia and Papua New Guinea, while in an El Nino year, Instead, the currents are relaxed and that warm water sloshes back against the coastline of the Americas, making for a warmer winter and a hotter summer. We're gonna, I'm going to be referencing some of the historical El Nino events of the past. And to do that, I wanna introduce this graphic. Before we get into those historical El Ninos, I wanna explain what we're looking at. Along the x-axis are two years of three month intervals of average uh, temperature anomalies for the El Nino region of the Pacific. Along the y-axis is the degree of this anomaly. Um, there's a gray shaded box in the middle between 0 0.5 and negative 0 0.5. Any rate, any temperature anomaly that falls within that range is considered normal or not significantly high or low. Whenever one of these gray lines, which represents two years worth of temperature anomalies, uh, goes above or below that gray box, it means that we are looking at an unusually hot or an unusually cold period. So looking at some of the largest El Ninos of the past uh, 50 years, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we had regular occurrences of El Ninos. And if you notice, as we were getting these events, they were becoming not only hotter, but also the high temperatures were persisting longer. And this is also true with the lead up to the 2015-2016 El Nino. 
In addition to these El Ninos, we've also started noticing something called marine heat waves. Now, marine heat wave is different than an El Nino. Um, you can have an average Nino year in the middle of the Pacific while still having a marine heat wave. Instead of a three month average, these are unseasonably high temperatures that last for five days or more. You can see in February 2014, we had this blob that was occurring where this big regional section of hot water was pushing up against the North American coastline. And that hot water seat persisted into 2015 and 2016, which also coincided with one of the largest El Nino events we have on record. Um, the 2015-2016 El Nino event not only had a higher temperature anomaly than many of the previous El Ninos, but it, that temperature anomaly also persisted longer. For reference, during the course of the years that I was studying on Catalina for this research, um, we had a very small El Nino that persisted just a little around the time that 2018 was transitioning into 2019. But for the most part, we were facing a quote unquote normal year condition. All right, so we looked at how El Nino impacts terrestrial forests. Now let's go underwater and look at how they impact kelp forests, particularly Macrocystis kelp forests, which are one of the dominant community types in Southern California. Macrocystis is a foundation species, which means it is integral to creating the habitats and also supports not only the animals that live there, but it's also supporting many of the economies associated with marine activity. We know that El Nino and marine heat waves can negatively impact kelp forests. During these events, the water is characterized by being warmer, having lower nutrients, and can also have increased storm activity. All of these activities lead to an increased amount of deforestation, as well as lower kelp recruitment in the kelp beds. The figure um, here shows some of, by Wheeler North, um, shows some of the deforestation patterns that are historic for some of these El Ninos. Um, we're going to be looking specifically at the kelp forest of Catalina Island. I chose to show you this map um, of Catalina, which is located off the coast of LA, because the majority of the economies around Catalina are focused on tourism as well as some commercial fisheries and have direct ties to um, tourism on the island, which have direct ties to the kelp forest. You can notice that all the little red and white dots are dive sites on the island, and people come here to see the beautiful kelp forest and all of the diversity that they support. I was also uh, brought to Catalina to look at the beautiful kelp. Uh, I started working uh, for the Catalina Environmental Leadership Program in 2013, and this is a pretty fair representation of what the cove I was working in looked like. I'd like you to keep an eye on the rock kind of in the middle of this picture, because that's the rock we're going to be taking a look at through the years. Um, it was a very lush kelp forest in 2013. As 2014 wore on, the water was getting hotter. We were seeing more kelp disappear. And then we had this huge typhoon that came in and ripped out most of the kelp, as well as several docks and boat moorings in the area. After that storm, uh, by the end of 2014, there was almost no kelp present. But we thought, well, it was warm, this water will cool off, the kelp will come back, no big deal. Instead, in spring of 2015, we had a very different kind of seaweed take over our uh, cove. It was this wiry, weird looking thing, and, no, and we weren't sure what it was. It turns out this new species was Sargassum horneri, which is an invasive species from, um, imported from Asia. To give you an idea of what this looks like, these are videos taken in the same month from two of my diff two different sites on the island during the course of my research. Um, as you can see, it's very different diving in a kelp forest compared to a sargassum thicket. And I was really curious as to what was going on. Why was sargassum out competing kelp so much during this warm water period? Was it a freak event because we had three consistent years of warm water? Or was there direct competition happening and what about sargassum was making it such a good competitor. Now, whenever I have questions about what's happening in a system, I like to understand the biology of an organism before trying to mess with it and figure out what exactly is going on. So to start with, we're gonna learn a little bit about macrocystis and how it goes about living in the kelp forest. So macrocystis is a brown algae in the order Laminariales. It's a perennial, which means it can persist from year to year. And when conditions are right, it will also have year round propagation. It also has a biphasic life history, which means it has a macrophyte or a visible stage and a microscopic stage as well. 
So the, the form of macrocystis we're probably most familiar with is the adult sporophyte. That's the piece that makes that beautiful, tall, towering kelp canopy. At the base of the sporophyte are sporophylls, or the reproductive blades, which on a special set of tissue called sori, produce zoospores. The zoospores, when released, will then uh, float in the water column, settle onto the substrate, and develop into a microscopic either male or female gametophyte. The male gametophyte develops a anthrozoid or a like kind of tiny little squirmy little thing. And the female gametophyte will develop an egg or an oogonium. The egg will release a hormone when it's mature and fully developed, drawing the anthrozoid to her. And then after syngamy, uh, the zygote is now ready to become a new sporophyte. Sargassum horneri, on the other hand, while a macroscopic brown algae, is native to Japan, Korea, and the East China Sea. It arrived in Southern California in the early 2000s, believed to have arrived in the Port of Los Angeles in or on a shipping container. It's an annual, which means that it, prop it grows, propagates, and then dies all within the course of one year. And it has something we, like, we refer to as an animalistic life history. If you would draw your attention to the, the center of the screen, you can see a zoomed in frond of a reproductive sargassum horneri. On the end of these fronds, there's these little chili pepper-like structures called receptacles. On the receptacles are pits called conceptacles. Here I have drawn, drawn a male and a female separate, even though on a plant, both male and female inhabit the same conceptacle. The male structures, antheridia, will release anthrozoids, which will then fertilize an oogonia either in the same pit or it will preferably leave and fertilize um, an egg in a different conceptacle on a different plant. Once syngamy occurs, the zygote is then packa packaged and then released from the adult plant, land lands on the seabed, and then immediately begins growing into its juvenile form. Uh, because there is no secondary microscopic life stage and there's internal for, there can be internal fertilization, this is referred to as an animalistic life history. Now, considering all of these things, I was curious if maybe sargassum was outcompeting macrocystis through reproduction or if there was something inherent about how it reproduced that made it easier for it to compete with kelp. So the first thing I needed to do to take on this question was understand the state of the kelp and sargassum on Catalina Island. So I constructed some questions to look at how many adults versus how many juveniles there were of these two species. And then um, I worked um, to construct some questions to get at that reproductive structure. So how was it about the size of the plants? Was it about the numbers? Was it about when they are releasing their propagules? And overall, was one producing more propagules than the other? And then lastly, I wanted to try and peek into the black box of what is happening once these propagules land. It's very hard to see and control for all of the factors that are happening on the seafloor. And so I designed a lab experiment to look at how Sargassum horneri was directly impacting gametophytes and how their growth could change in the presence and absence of each other, as well as at different temperatures. All right, so we're going to move on to methods. Um, just for some orientation for those of you um, that are not familiar with the location of Moss Landing as well as Catalina. Uh, Moss Landing is located in the heart of, the, of Monterey Bay up um, towards San Jose in the Bay Area. I have a little blue wave icon indicating the location of MLML Labs. And then Catalina is all the way down by Los Angeles indicated with a gold star next to the logo for USD's Wrigley Institute of Environmental Studies. Zooming into the island, this is the location of my four study sites. Um, the same methods were carried out at all four sites. At the be prior to starting the, the, these and prior to the El Nino, all of these sites had lush kelp forests uh, before the storm in the El Nino. Um, they all were at a similar depth and anecdotally all had similar exposure gradients. All right, so first we're going to tackle uh, the methods for my field work and related to the questions of density and reproduction. And then we'll move on to the lab experiment. So first was uh, conducting a bunch of population surveys. At each one of my sites, I had a sunken set of cinder blocks that were weighed down and had a phobo temperature logger attached so that I could confirm if my sites all had the same temperature or different temperatures. Uh, the ho the um, each transect 
came off was 10 by two meters for kelp, for kelp swaths so that counted the number of adult kelp and the number of juvenile kelp. And then to tackle sargassum density, uh, there were two two meter quadrats set at predetermined points along the transect and all the sargassum was counted within those quadrats. So that gets at the density, but for biomass, I had, a, I had an issue. How did I weigh kelp underwater? Um, I was very aware of how devastating the deforestation was on Catalina, which meant I could not clear cut my study sites in order to answer the question of how much biomass there was. So instead, I created a length to biomass relationship for macrocystis on the island. Again, because I could not cut kelp out of my sites, I was able to get a permit instead for drift kelp which meant I kayaked around collecting as much fresh drift kelp as I could every morning after the tides had changed. And, or, and I only collected ones that were um, connected with pulled pass, that were not rotting, didn't have major herbivory marks. And then I brought those all up, untangled them and measured and weighed all of the fronds. In total, I collected about 108 kelp over the course of uh, one summer. And this is the pattern that I, I found. Um, I was able to get a pretty good correlation uh, between length and weight. And then using equations uh, from a paper by Dan Reed, I was able to take measurements instead of kelp underwater, which I could then equate to the size and length and number of stipes, which when plugged into my length to biomass regression allowed me to estimate the biomass of a full adult kelp in situ without removing it from the water. To estimate reproductive biomass, and again, to ensure that I wasn't impacting the amount of reproduction too much, I would count all of the sporophylls on the individuals I was measuring for biomass, and then collect a subsample of five sporophylls. So while I was measuring all the kelp, my dive buddy would be collecting sargassum. Because sargassum is an invasive species, we could collect the whole individual and then take it with us back to the lab. For each site, six individuals were collected. All right, so once we got back to the lab, this is what happened to the reproductive material to confirm that it actually was reproductive. For the kelp, the sporophylls uh, were weighed in total, and then the sori cover was estimated and the sori weight taken as well. And then from the sori, five hole punches were collected and dyed and, and preserved in formalin for later cross-sectioning. Cross-sectioning allowed me to see if sporangia were fully developed and if they were developing on one or both sides of the sorus. For sargassum horneri, um, similar process. Now in these pictures, it's very hard to see just how big these are. Um, so for reference, um, I'm about five foot four and this is how big um, these, these individuals are. So they, when they are full size, they can be quite, quite large. All right, so if the sargassum was reproductive, which remember means that they have these chili pepper receptacles on them, uh, after weighing the whole individual, the receptacles re were removed to get a measure of reproductive biomass. Five random receptacles for each plant were then removed and placed in formalin for preservation and later to be cross-sectioned to count the number of eggs per receptacle. Now this faced me with the issue of how many conceptacles per receptacle because uh, it takes quite a lot of work to count every single conceptacle. Um, instead, I took a subsample of 25 receptacles, counted all the conceptacles, and created a prediction model. Uh, so that way I could just weigh each receptacle before cross-sectioning in order to uh, estimate the number of conceptacles. And then this is what the cross-sections look kind of the ring or, or the pit, and then the dark circles inside are the eggs. Okay, switching gears, we're now gonna move on to the methods for my lab culture experiment. Um, again, uh, sporophylls and, and sargassum that had visible fuzzy receptacles, which is a good sign that they were putting out zygotes or about to put out zygotes were collected. They were then washed in a sterile seawater and iodine bath to remove diatoms and other things that could infect my cultures. They were then cold packed at 12 degrees C and kept cold for transport back to Moss Landing Marine Labs, where they were placed in sterile seawater um, so that the kelp blades would release their zoospores and sargassum horneri would release its zygotes. I grew my cultures in try well petri dishes. The kelp gametophytes were settled at an equal density across all wells. To look at how sargassum impacted the kelp, 
two wells were settled with sargassum, one with 100 sargassum zygotes, and then just to see what the max impact these guys would have, um, I doubled that for 200 zygotes for a third well. I had six petri dishes per temperature treatment set up like this, and then each treatment had a different temperature. The first was 12 degrees C, which is known to be a good health culturing temperature, 15 degrees C as an intermediate temperature, and then 19 degrees C, which is a value that could be a future predicted average temperature on Catalina, but is also known to not be a great spot for kelp to grow. They were sampled weekly where they got media changes to ensure they had plenty of nutrients and each, and then on the media change day, they were photographed in order to count the number of gametophytes and what type of growth stage they were in, as well as the sargassum horneri to count and then see how, what growth stage they were in. Cultures were grown to three to four weeks, depending on timing, as well as if they were still alive by the end of the third week. All right, results. We're gonna go through the results in the same order that we went through the methods and we're gonna start with looking at density demography. So how much kelp, how much sargassum was out there? Uh, since some of you may not be completely familiar with seaweed and to help you guys out a little bit, just to remind you of what I counted as an adult versus a juvenile. An adult kelp was one meter or greater in height and had multiple stipes, whereas a juvenile was a kelp that was less than one meter and showed signs of recently bifurcating or pre-bifurcation, but had pneumatocysts present, so it could be positively ID'd as a macrocystis. The juvenile sargassum is a fern-like small rosette that likes to hang out on the ocean floor. And when it is triggered to start forming its adult stage, it bolts where one frond will come straight up and it'll go from being this very wide, low-lying rosette to a tall uh, frond similar to bracken or alfalfa. Okay, before we get into the result slides, uh, all of them are organized in a similar manner, so I want to point, walk you through that before we get into all these graphs. At the beginning of each section, I have a small table that shows the p-value for each site as well as time, which was significant against all of my field data, and what that means is that all of the sites were significantly different in data that they need to be presented separately. Time was significant because the populations changed through time, and I analyzed the different months using a two-piece post hoc, which I'll get to in a second. First, the x-axis is, is time. Uh, each letter represents a different month, and 2018 and 2019 are split, so you can see where that transition happens. The y-axes are typically different between the two graphs, and I will try to draw your attention to that so you can notice the differences in density, probability release, etc. In the upper left-hand corner, I have the site, what we're, what we're looking at, as well as a small map insert. There's a little yellow dot or gold star that is going to wander around the map to remind you where on the island these sites are. On the right-hand side, I have a little cartoon that'll help you remember what we're comparing. In this one, for instance, we're comparing adults to juveniles, and so I have a juvenile kelp drawing and adult kelp drawing. And then in order to show where the significant peaks in time were using that two piece post hoc, I've inserted some circles to highlight the relevant months that all grouped out as having the highest density according to that post hoc test. Okay, so we're gonna start with intake pipes and I'd like to, in, like to start with the adults. For kelp, the highest density in adults occurred between July and September of 2018, whereas for sargassum, the highlight of adults is between January and March of 2019. For juveniles, the highest density of kelp juveniles was in June of 2019. And for sargassum, the highest density of juveniles was in January, right before the big push of adults. And then in July and August, after most of the adults had semestered. For Howland's Landing, it's a similar pattern, but kelp was more significant than the sargassum. And the kelp had its high peaks again in August and September of 2018, and then in July and August of 2019, with a peak in juveniles occurring in July of 2019. For chalk wall uh, across both sites, they were relatively similar. The adults of kelp uh, did follow that pattern. However, 
They only occurred in 2019. We had, did not have any adults at this site in 2018. Again, sargassum, the there were juveniles present almost all year round and adults began popping up uh, between November and January of, of 2018 to 2019. Indian Rock overall had very low health density of juvenile or adults and had a lot of sargassum. The peak in juvenile sargassum for this site were August and September of 2018 and for adults was February and March of 2019. Okay, now that we know uh, when the adults versus the juveniles are present, we're going to focus on the adults and look at how much vegetative biomass there was and then how much reproductive biomass there was. Uh, this will help to kind of see if it's the size, if the size of the plants has anything to do with how much stuff is out there in the water. So looking at the intake price with vegetative biomass, uh, as would be expected when we had the most adult kelp, we also had the most vegetative biomass in July, August, and September of 2018. While sargassum, we had the highest density of adult biomass in February through uh, May of 2019. Howland's Landing follows a similar pattern to the density graphs where there's the most vegetative biomass in the late summer, early fall of 2018 and in summer of 2019. While Sargassum has its peak in a vegetative biomass um, in the spring of 2019. Chalk wall, there was very little to no uh, vegeta adult vegetative biomass throughout the whole course of the study, while sargassum had its peak in February through May of 2019. Indian Rock, I only had one adult that started off there in uh, the summer of 2018, and it quickly became removed during one of the storms. And, and then 2019, it really had a good peak of sargassum in March. Okay, so moving on to reproductive biomass. Um, remember, we're gonna be looking at the sporophylls versus the receptacles of these two species. And for these graphs, I want you to start paying attention to the y-axis. Notice on the kelp y-axis, it only goes up to 200 grams, whereas the sargassum y-axis goes up to 15,000 grams. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these peaks and valleys. For intake pipes, the highest amount of reproductive biomass occurred again in late summer, early fall. And then for the sargassum, the highest peak occurred in May of 2019. Howland's Landing, the highest peak occurred in June of 2019 for kelp. And then sargassum, while well, all of the months that there was reproductive material didn't show great difference, differences, it did kind of follow that pattern of being in the spring. Chalk wall uh, overall compared to the other sites and comparatively across months were all very low and so we're not seeing it. And same with Indian Rock, there was no kelp bio reproductive biomass observed. And then in Sargassum, all of the months were really similar. So to get at this, and so looking at all this and wondering how much of a role the size of the individual plays and how much reproduction is happening for the individual, I ran uh, these regressions to look at if there were any kind of relationships. For kelp, it was a very weak relationship um, of, with an R value of 0 0.087. And what that means is that while there is a relationship possible, um, it does, it, does it, it means you can have a really big kelp that's not producing any sporophylls and a very small kelp producing lots of sporophylls. While sargassum had a very strong correlation of 0 0.9 uh, 065. And if you look at this picture of one of the re reproductive sargassums, you can see why. Um, this particular one is just investing so much in producing receptacles and not very much in vegetative blades that would be responsible for photosynthesis. Okay, so the big question is, we see all this biomass, well, is it actually producing things? Uh, when is the actual peak in the propagules that these pieces of biomass should be producing. So to get at this question uh, required a lot of cross-sectioning and a lot of microscope work. It also requires a little bit of math, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So one of the four fathers of kelp science was a guy named Neuschel, and he calculated that there are 3.5 times 10 to the fifth spores per millimeter squared on a sori, and the sori should be 
present on both sides of the blade. Um, observing through my cross sections, I noticed that there wasn't always sores present on both sides, that you could have fully developed sporangia on one side and the other side was still working on it. And so using the size and weight of the punches, I was able to calculate the number of spores that would be expected per gram. Um, so about, to figure out one gram is about the size of a post-it note in the case of my health anyway. And then using the cross sections, I could calibrate how reproductive that sori for a certain sporophyll was. So multiplying my adjusted neutrals number, I could figure out how many uh, grams of sori to how many spores are per sporophyll. Once I had spores per sporophyll, I could look at across the sporophylls that I collected from one individual to come up with the average number of spores that that individual was likely producing at any given point in time. I then multiply that by the density of reproductive adults at my site to get a number for spores per site. Sargassum, it went through a similar process. I knew how many eggs per conceptacle I had, and I did multiple conceptacles per receptacle for that egg count. I could then take the pre-cross-section weight of the receptacle to calculate number of conceptacles to get number of eggs per receptacle. Knowing roughly how many receptacles I had per individual from weighing them all, I then could calculate the number of eggs per individual, multiply this by the number of reproductive adults at each site for that time to get the number of eggs per site. Okay, so big question, when are they reproducing and is this putting them into some direct conflict? Looking at intake pipes, it appears that Sargassum corneri is reproducing first in February where it has the biggest um, input of propagules. However, if you look again at these y-axis, you'll notice that kelp, on the other hand, while it is reproducing later in June, it is producing two to three times more the magnitude of zoospores compared to zygotes that kelp is produced, that uh, sargassum is producing. Highlands Landing, a uh, pat similar pattern occurs where sargassum is producing its propagules mainly in the spring and in, in April as being the most reproductive month, while in June, kelp is producing the most of its zoospores. Uh, for chalk wall, uh, again, it's very limited kelp early on. Uh, there was still little peaks in the late spring going into summer, and then the sargassum had its peaks in March through May, but they were not significantly different. And then Indian Rock, uh, there was no reproduction observed at this site, while the sargassum had their largest peak in reproduction in March. Okay. We're now gonna switch gears and go look at the lab cultures and how these would interact potentially if there was a fresh zygote and fresh gametophyte on the substrate at the same time. Okay, before we get into the graph, to help those of you who might not have ever seen a kelp gametophyte, I have a little cartoon on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, once the zoospores settle, they develop into kind of these little octopusy, like moss-like creatures um, on the seabed. And I only counted female gametophytes because they're a little easier to see and they're the only ones that produce eggs, which means they're the only ones that could become a sporophyte. And so once the gametophyte is settled, it will develop an egg. Uh, once the egg is ready and if it can find a male, it will then start dividing to become a sporophyte. But because of the short time that my cultures survived, I never got to see a full sporophyte by itself. And so the gametophyte with the sporophyte attached became the end stage that I focused on. Um, if you look at the graph, the x axis on the bottom, I have it separated first by algae treatment. So if it was kelp growing by itself, kelp growing with sargassum horneri, or kelp growing with a very high number of sargassum horneri. Above those labels, you'll see the different temperature treatments of 12 degrees C, 15 degrees C, and 19 degrees C. And then the y-axis is the number of gametophytes at the different stages per millimeter squared. And you can see um, on the first sample time period, which was about a little over a week after they were first settled, um, there's already a little bit of a difference of occurring where there's the most development in the 12 degree C treatment. At time period two, um, there's still that a little bit of that disparity, but all 
temperature treatments were developing gametophytes with eggs and it had gametophyte survival overall. By the last time treatment, um, some definite patterns did seem to persist where uh, there were sporophytes developing across all temperature treatments, but the most sporophytes were developing in the 12 degree C treatment, as well as that treatment having the most survival. All right, looking at the sargassum, uh, we only have sargassum in two wells, so there's only two sides of the graphs, and again, um, that temperature treatment along the x-axis, and then sargassum density per millimeter squared. The cartoon on the right-hand side shows the developmental biomarkers I was looking for. So when they're first zygotes, they look like a little round egg. Then they develop rhizoids, which are somewhat analogous to the way roots and plants look, and they're more just to hold the zygote to the substrate in this context. Then they, the other end become, gets indented as a precursor to developing blades. That indent gets larger until two very small pinnate blades start to separate. So you can see at sample time one already, I have uh, little zygotes that are developing rhizoids. A couple are developing indents, which is very, very fast compared to um, what I was expecting to see. Time period two, I have even more and also some, um, some developing precursors of blades. And by the end, um, especially in the 19 degree treatment, over half or more of the zygotes were developing pinnate blades and almost taking up the entire field of view under the microscope. Um, should also be noted that well, even though I wasn't necessarily expecting them to do so well, at the coldest temperature, there were still sargassum that were hanging in there and developing to that bladed stage along with their peers in the hotter temperatures. Okay, so let's, that was a lot. So let's summarize this all together. Um, the highest density of adults for um, macrocystis was observed between June and September, while sargassum, the highest density of adults was observed in January through April. The reproductive bat biomass followed this same structure of macrocystis having the highest reproductive biomass in the summer heading towards fall, and then sargassum having the heaviest amount of reproductive biomass uh, February through April. Uh, looking at those relationships of if a bigger individual alga has a higher uh, reproductive strength. It looked like for kelp there wasn't a strong correlation where for sargassum there was. Pe peak Propagule production for macrocystis occurred in June, while for sargassum horneri, it seemed to occur in the spring, late winter between February and April. And looking at the lab cultures, it looked like macrocystis was having the most success at a cooler temperature of 12 degrees C, while sargassum was having the most success at 19 degrees C. All right, so we've summarized the results and now we're gonna bring them into context with some of the other work that has been done on this topic and on Catalina. So as we head into this, I wanna kind of bring this figure back to remind you that during El Nino, we, we observe kelp deforestation and also lower recruitment. And that's usually when there's these hotter temperatures. And looking at these patterns of when we had a lot of adult kelp versus a lot of adult sargassum, I'm really interested as to why this pattern occurred and if this um, post El Nino period is partly partially responsible for this unusual pattern. Also, um, in the literature, it's a little bit of an argument whether the gametophytes can persist for longer than a few weeks in Southern California in the substrate, just waiting for a good opportunity to go through creating eggs and reproducing and making more sporophytes. And this is really interesting because I have all those adults in the summer and fall of 2018, but I don't see a huge influx of juveniles until 2019. And since it's uncertain, could these gametophytes be hanging out? Or there's also a couple other tricks kelp has up its sleeve. Even though we see that there's a lot of deforestation and cover that's lost during El Nino's and also warmer time periods of, and after storms, I also observed that there are these weird things that I dub sporophyll holdfast or sporophyll bushes where you'll have a full mature holdfast that has been devo devoid of blades, likely due to a storm event, but it is just pumping out sporophylls and so spores. Um, these, I saw these at a bunch of my sites in February and March, which would typically be a kelp recurring window. Um, 
And so I'm wondering what role these have in, in increasing kelp recruitment that we just aren't seeing because we typically measure kelp quickly when we're doing aerial covers. And then also there's drift recruitment. So the chalkball site started with one or two juveniles and by the end had a really healthy little stand of adult kelp. And I think that might in part be to do some big drift events that kind of came through that area um, over the winter. Okay, so again, we see that those big adults from macrocystis in the summer into the fall of 2018. And then Sargassum is going its biggest adults in 2019. Um, one thing that is interesting is that because there was a huge storm in December of 2018 and so little kelp canopy, because you can see like we didn't have very many much kelp observed in those winter months when sargassum grows, is it possible that it's just taking advantage of when kelp is gone because there's more light, potentially more nutrients. Um, and also one thing that's interesting, the juveniles seem to be present year round. So is it these abiotic triggers that make it bolt or is it a predetermined calendar that it has uh, tr that's triggered by other factors that make it bolt and have that reproductive window be when it just so happens kelp canopy is at its lowest. All right, so macrocystis had its highest release rate in the summer and early fall, um, and then little bursts of sporangia production throughout the year as well. This is really different than what I expected to see. In the literature, it's expected that kelp would have its biggest recruitment window in the spring, which to coincide with upwelling season and cold nutrient rich currents. So that would typically take place February, March, April into May. Instead, I didn't see the big push of those spores until June. There's also a possibility that there's just a lot of heat stress because in 2019, even though we were a weak El Nino year, there also was a heat wave that was uh, brewing around that time. So could this big tropical release that I've been seeing in the summer also be due to heat stress and just this prolonged heat stress making the kelp not live quite as long and reproduce because it's stressed out. Sargassum, um, on the other hand, had its highest peak in reproduction um, months before kelp even got its zoospores out there on the substrate. Um, and it was actually happening during part of that expected kelp recruitment window. Um, this is the season that Sargassum was expected to reproduce because that's what's been observed prior to and during the El Nino. However, there also was no fall cohort of reproduction in sargassum observed while I was conducting this study. During the warm blob years and the El Nino years, it was observed to have two uh, cohorts of reproduction, one in the spring and then one in the fall in um, some time between September and October. However, however, I was wondering if this could be because 2018 and 2019 overall had slightly cooler temperatures. So as a reminder, um, this kind of shows the El Nino patterns and some of those anomalies from 2015, 2016, previous El Ninos, and then the year of the study. And again, the, the blob made it anomalously hot against California's coast, even if not across the whole Pacific. And this is really interesting looking at the past because in 1982 and 1983, there was something similar that happened on Catalina. This particular event had a longer period of hot anomalous water, but it also had an invasive sargassum, sargassum muticum. And it was thought at the time that the influx of sargassum muticum and how much substrate it took over might have contributed to the slow recovery of kelp from the 1980s El Nino. But just like there's extreme hot events, there's also extreme cold events. And so in 1988 and 89, there was an extreme La Nina or cold water event. During this event, uh, the kelp was able to reproduce so effectively that Sargassum muticum lost a lot of the cover it had gained. And now we think of Sargassum muticum not as a terrible invasive species, but as another background seaweed in this system. So potentially, this could lead to, if we have another very strong La Nina, maybe Sargassum Horneri will take on this role. Further evidence that temperature plays a big role in how these species are interacting can be seen in the laboratory study I did. 
Um, more gametophytes and sporophytes for kelp were developing at that cooler temperature. Um, However, but it didn't seem like it cared whether Sargassum horneri was present or not. The only gametophytes that seemed to be impacted were the ones that Sargassum was growing immediately on top of. Uh, during the El Nino, when Sargassum took over, uh, there was a lot of questions about if Sargassum was exhibiting any allelopathy or chemical warfare against kelp gametophytes and inhibiting their growth. Um, in my cultures, I did not see any evidence of that. Um, and also surprisingly for kelp in these cultures, I was seeing sporophytes, not many, but some that did develop at 19 degrees C. Uh, in a previous study conducted by a beer pig, um, we had a uh, they, they had studied how temperature impacted kelp gametophytes for Monterey, and the Monterey kelp gametophytes did not um, survive at 19 degrees C or develop eggs very well. So I was, I was very surprised to see any sporophyte activity at 19 degrees C. For Sargassum horneri, um, more developed more quickly at 19 degrees C, which I was kind of expecting um, since it seemed to do so well during those hot years. But I was also really surprised that it was still developing and surviving at that cooler temperature because for a long time, the conventional wisdom has been that Sargassum horneri hasn't come north of Southern California because at point conception, the temperatures change so much. And it apparently can survive at some of those cooler temperatures. Maybe it just can't do as well. Okay, so it's kind of the big takeaways from what I observed during uh, my thesis was that macrocystis seems to be reproducing most on Catalina during the summer and fall, and in the lab it grew better during cooler temperatures. While Sargassum horneri reproduced most in the winter and spring, it was growing better under warmer temperatures, and it also was developing much faster than kelp. So what does this mean given the context of climate change where we're expected to have more extreme weather events, an increased frequency of El Nino and marine heat waves, and how do we address these global issues in a local way? Uh, Mike, you might want to cover your ears because I'm going to start talking about applied science. We have to use um, some natural resource management things for the marine system. Things like MPAs, um, there was a study that was done and released in 2018 that showed that bigger, older MPAs were more resistant to sargassum horneri invasion. They had more predators like lobster and things that kind of interacted with the herbivory invertebrates that allowed uh, kelp to be more resilient. We also could conduct more management ex focused experiments. Uh, aquaculture is becoming a big deal with things like growing kelp for biofuel and seaweed for food. Maybe we could take some of these skills and apply them to kelp in order to artificially seed with spore bags areas that are impacted by low recruitment or plant out juveniles after an El Nino season to artificially create a bigger, denser kelp forest. And then lastly, my favorite is outreach, raising awareness about invasive species and informing anglers and boaters to clean their anchors so they don't spread sargassum. And this is so important because as we've recently learned, sargassum can spread even in Monterey. Uh, during January and February of 2019, uh, fertile adults were found in Monterey Harbor and Elkhorn Slough uh, by the harbor mouth. And then this year in 2020, even though it was a slight La Nina cold year, a reef check diver conducting surveys at the breakwater in Monterey found a juvenile sargassum horneri that was embedded in the rocks. So it can come here and it can live here. So it's important to be vigilant about invasive species. All right, conclusions. Um, thank you for coming with me on this journey of looking at how kelp and sargassum are interacting on the island. It's very startling when you see a habitat you think you know and love go from one form to another. And it's important to ask questions about why this is happening and question sometimes what we think we know about how these interact. My results um, and observations were that things weren't always as they seem and different species have different advantages locally in their own habitat and region. Sargassum, for example, in this situation has advantages. It grows and reproduces most in the winter when there's likely more light and more nutrients available. Its animalistic life history and inter internal fertilization allows the zygotes to grow quickly once they hit the substrate without going through a period of microscopic waiting. 
It also prefers warmer temperatures like those that occur during an El Nino heat wave, and that might even speed up their development. But macrocystis also has its own advantages. One macrocystis can produce magnitudes more zoospores than sargassum at a given point in time, and also it produces throughout the year. So numbers in, in the numbers game, macrocystis is amazing, and it can definitely trounce and run circles around sargassum. It's also a perennial, so if you have a really strong heat-resistant kelp that can persist for multiple years, it will continue to propagate those hopefully heat-tolerant um, zoospores. And just as we've learned this week uh, with unpredictable cold snaps can happen as a result of climate change as well as heat waves, and so maybe if we get some unusually strong La Niñas, it will also contribute to kelp having some advantages in this system. That being said, there's lots of space for further research on this topic. Um, I'd really be interested to know if the observations of when kelp was having its peak recruitment windows were due to climate change or just an artifact of so many years of deforestation. Um, we know that shifting recruitment and reproduction windows are shifting for terrestrial plants with earlier pollination seasons or birds migrating out of um, their normal times during the year. I'd also be interested to see how other kelp forests in the Southern California Bight and Channel Islands are comparing. Are they having a strong recovery? Are they getting into this weird where part of the year they're sargassum, part of the year they're kelp um, cycle? I don't know. It'd be really interesting, I think, to, to find out for farther management. And then one thing that I'd be really interested since I saw my, some of my gametophytes were a lot stronger um, than some of the literature that used Monterey, focused gametophytes is if there's any genetic differences between Baja, Southern California bite kelp and Monterey kelp. And is there some genetic trigger that allows some macrocystis to be more heat tolerant than others? And lastly, but not least, um, is some experimenting and testing for some of these different management strategies where you're using ideas from terrestrial ecology and aquaculture to try and artificially increase kelp recruitment while removing sargassum during these heat wave and El Nino years. Just like our forests are dynamic and ever-changing, are going to face new challenges to native species as we get hotter weather, more fires, and invasive species, we need to also think about what's happening under the water to our marine forests. They are just as important and just as essential to our well-being, um, whether they're the same or whether they have new species and new challenges to contend with. Thank you so much for joining me on um, this journey to Catalina. Um, I hope that once for all I will travel again, you'll get a chance to see and experience these wonderful kelp forests for yourself. Now, thank you so much for coming. And I have a lot of amazing people who made this possible to thank. So we're gonna get through these acknowledgements and then I'll take some questions. Now there's way more people um, that I need to thank than who's on the slide. Uh, but I just wanna highlight some people in particular and then we'll um, get to the questions. So I didn't have pictures for all of them all, but I need to highlight the Wrigley staff before I get into the rest. Um, this project would not have happened without their help and their constant willingness to answer all of my emails and letting me borrow so much of their equipment. So thank you guys. And then I wanna call out my committee. Um, Diana, one of the first uh, professors to answer all of the cold emails I sent out when looking for graduate programs. Um, thank you for so much and sharing uh, <laughs> my enthusiasm for adventures with going to Baja and um, helping out with Catalina and just kind of questioning what are the bounds of what we can do with uh, science and equipment. Um, Mike, it's been a real pleasure being in your lab and the beer pigs and getting to go on adventures like Chile, which you can see here, uh, Mike's already hit the Piscos a little bit. Um, and then Tom, uh, thank you so much for being on my committee, being reliable with all of my stats and questions about how currents and temperature work and where to find good resources. Um, for those who know me, you know, math has never been my favorite thing, but uh, Tom, you really broke it down and made it really, really fun to learn how to uh, work with physics properly. 
I then have to thank all of my amazing volunteers, whether they were a part of the Wrigley Fellows that were living on the island with me during this, or my lab mates that I was able to <laughs> bribe and harass to come help me on my project on Catalina, um, where they just came and worked with me in the lab, dove with me, um, and the only thing I could pay them in was like, free trip to Catalina, and I'll feed you. Uh, so thank you guys so much for helping. And then um, in the middle is my UROC intern, Summer, who helped me process so many of my samples and cross sections through this course. Um, and then I have to thank the CELT staff who were um, integral in kind of getting me into grad school and kind of being my constant source of inspiration as I like was trying to figure out how crazy grad school, school works. So thank you guys. And I know Mike mentioned a lot of like the academic side of like what we do here at Moss Landing, but we also have a lot of fun and you get really close to everyone as well. Um, these uh, pictures feature some of the most memorable moments of like Halloween and um, like the Baja trip. And then also, uh, I don't know if every cohort is like this, but I got particularly lucky with my cohort um, from 2016. We all are and were incredibly close friends um, for the first uh, three years or so when we all were here. We held a Thanksgiving every year since most of us um, had such a short break we couldn't go see our families during those times. And speaking of family, um, these are some of the beer pigs. You can see we're not only seaweed obsessed, but we also believe in looking good no matter what's going on. Um, it really has been like um, a family and always, and we always have each other's backs and go on the craziest wild adventures, whether that's a run um, to home goods or the inner tidal in the middle of the night, or just trying to figure out how the heck to get that statistics program to work. And then I need to thank my family who've been incredibly supportive through all of this, even through all of the Holidays, Christmases, and birthdays are best. Particularly um, those who supported me, even though um, they are not able to watch me to find today. And now lastly, I have to thank this guy. Um, Sid is an amazing partner and individual. Um, and he's been so supportive, especially through all the craziness of 2020. Um, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> we started pulling things uh, together in a more serious way after I completed my um, field work. So he didn't get a chance to go to Catalina, but I hope to rectify that soon once we're all able to be vaccinated and travel, um, particularly as uh, we start our new uh, chapter of life together um, in uh, the coming years. Again, like I said, there are so many people to thank uh, my committee, all my volunteers, all the people who helped me harass my volunteers into going. Um, again, the Wrigley, the Wrigley staff, um, and then so many more people at LMLL, um, Tara and Ivano for helping me navigate all of the intricacies of getting um, the paperwork and things filed. So. To, to talk from MLML to CHMB to San Jose State. Uh, Kathleen and Jocelyn, who have been um, so amazing and for hiring me for the museum job and giving me the freedom to just kind of explore and uh, run wild in um, the world of museum science and to learn and try and build my skills as much as possible. Um, Katie and Gita for helping me with the library and anytime I had a random writing or other question, um, Jim for being so supportive of the students. And then of course, Michelle and Jane and the rest of the front office team who always made sure that we get registered and paid and just really help the, the student employees um, uh, figure out how to get things done and also how to order things for classes when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you need supplies to get to students. <laughs> The IT team because I am not IT savvy and the shop guys, um, uh, they helped me a lot with figuring out how to build things and find things for the museum and always had a kind word and a smile whenever, no matter what kind of day you're having. And then of course, um, my funding sources and the people who like kind of helped make a lot of that possible for awarding me the service awards and the fellowship um, and also uh, 
for, for the participation in Iraq. I know in this time of 20, in 2020 in a pandemic when we feel really isolated, um, I feel the like, especially in this space, the ocean is something that connects us. And in the face of climate change and invasive species and all of the craziness we have going on, I wanted to leave you with this thought from uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau, who's one of the founders of my old program on Catalina. We are all connected to the ocean. Without health, healthy oceans, no life, not even on land can exist. And I think that's really important that we take into consideration our connections to the natural world because Without having a healthy world, it is very difficult for humans to be healthy as well. And with that, thank you. And I will take questions at this point. All right, well done. And I'd ask you to go ahead and reach over and grab a Kleenex, but you're in the museum and all there is is chem wipes. <laughs> I have I have some real I have some real paper towel too. <laughs> so I'm gonna be monitoring the participants as they start to raise their hands, but I'll go ahead and start off with a question. Um, I know Anne's got places to go, so we're gonna get whatever questions uh, you guys would like to ask done first, and then um, we're gonna give her a round of applause, and then her committee is gonna stick around for a few minutes on Zoom, and, and finish up some of the proceedings. So Anne, you know, it was really fun just watching you pull this all together and 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 see your journey over the last few years. And one of the things that stuck out that I really agreed with is that it seems like a lot of what's going on you know, your sargassum, the juveniles are constantly there, but the adult biomass, which is kind of like the really important part of the sargassum, it comes and goes, and it doesn't come and go when the kelp comes and goes, it comes and goes opposite it. So really one of the things that comes out of this study that would be to look for in the future is why does that adult senesce, right? Why doesn't the adult um, sargassum that shows up in that, that springtime, almost early summer, why doesn't it stick around? It, it seems to die off, which gives macrocystis back that window. Um, is that program, do you think, um, just due to the time of year or does it actually not like the warmer water? Do you have a feeling for this? I, I think it's programmed the way a lot of annuals are programmed. I think one of the factors that are contributing to it is because when it, it takes so much energy and so much of whatever uh, sugars or things that's bringing in during its photosynthetic period, it just seems to stop producing blades and just becomes nothing but a stipe or stem with receptacles on it. Um, I can, let me see if I can find that picture again, um, which I think kind of gives you like a sense of what it, what it looks like. Cause at first it's, when it's a first becomes an adult, it folds upright and it's just this very fuzzy, very fern-like individual. But when it starts um, putting on receptacles, first there's just a few at the tips and then it becomes further down. And then all of a sudden, almost the, oh, here, we'll use this one, almost the entire um, length of, a, of what would be considered a blade or a frond, almost the entire thing becomes just full of receptacles. Um, and I think that's triggered more so by time than anything else. And then my guess without looking into it further would be that by the time it has put so much energy into these receptacles, it doesn't have the energy to put on any kind of photosynthetic material to save itself for later. Um, it's really interesting in, in June and once in a while in like once in a while into July, there would be these stipes with that would like be so straggly and there would be no blades on it and you'd have like three or four little receptacles that were just rotting like they had fish bites taken out of them they did not have any eggs left present and it's just this straggly stipe hanging ghost-like in mid-water just like can't reproduce because it's done but it can't put on blades anymore and so well, I wonder that, that does suggest then uh, that there might not be such a doomsday, you know, I think your results would suggest if, because it was pretty regular that your, your, if you got adults showing up at any of your four sites in the sargassum, they tended to crap out right there in that June, July period. So that would, that would suggest that there's a reprieve here, um, whether it be competition or not, or for macrocystis. I do, I got a couple of hands up though. I'm going to, I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Diana now. Um, one of your committee members who um, can unmute yourself, Diana, and go ahead and, and ask uh, Anne your question. 
Hi, great job. Um, you mentioned that your data uh, could be used for management strategies and that, that to increase macrocystis. And I'm wondering based on the biology of the two species and your results and relative to Dayton and the other results you brought up, um, for restoration, where would you send restoration workers to make clearings? Well, would they work, do you think? And where would you send them in what season? And how would you advise them based on your results? Yeah, so I would say based on my results, the, the most useful way that would also be kind of the most efficient use of resources would be first, rather than tackling the sargassum, would be to find ways to increase kelp recruitment. Um, I know with storms, this is a little tricky, but I, I think what could be really useful is there is a way to engineer attaching spore bags to various sites before the sargassum reproduction window and see if that allows the gametophytes to get enough of a head start before that major sargassum reproduction window in February through April so that you have some juveniles that are maybe able to kind of establish their space before um, the sargassum zygotes get in. Uh, for sargassum, because when it is an adult, it becomes very brittle and it fragments so easily. I would recommend um, if you have an area that is almost completely covered with sargassum juveniles where there's not really any traditional understory species left, that it'd be almost more useful to focus on getting rid of some sargassum juveniles when they're in that five to 10 centimeter rosette stage, and then attempting to reseed kelp in those areas simultaneously. Um, I could be very wrong. I don't know if this would work, uh, but I think that could be an area of investigation. Thanks. We'll ask you more later. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, Diana's going to have you captive audience in your committee meeting. So next up, we've got your fellow beer pig, Dan Gossard, has a question. Dan, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Ann. Uh, great job. I love the drawings. Thanks, Dan. Um, you already know that. But um, so I, I wanted to follow up with what uh, Mike and Di were both saying. So first of all, in the winter, have, have there been any studies uh, relating to the, the diminishing of the irradiance levels and the, the lowering of the photoperiod day length uh, in relation to uh, sargasm uh, putting, putting on biomass or losing biomass or senescing? Um, not that I'm aware of. However, it is still early days for publishing uh, work on sargassum horneri in the North American coastline. Uh, a lot of the papers on sargassum that I've found were located in um, Japan, Korea, Northern China, um, and the translations for those don't always make a lot of sense. Um, uh, using, I was using Google Translate, so I was a little hampered by the tools I was using um, rather than the writing of those scientists. And so it's very likely that there is a paper out there in a different language that I have just not come across yet, but that would be a really interesting study to conduct somewhere in Southern California, because due to latitude, longitude, and all of that, we are gonna experience different light regimes here than we would um, on the Asian coastline. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, uh, it'd be interesting to look at that, you know, as the latitude gets, uh... Uh, increases in relation to the susceptibility to invasion. Um, and on that regard, um, I have to ask, if La Niñas are persistent, you know, over the next whatever decades, is, is this really a threat in at all? Like, is uh, to kelp? Um, it, will the kelp, will resilience of kelp um, overcome the, the, the Horneri invasion overall? That's a great question. I think if we took climate change 
um, off to the side for a minute and we kind of just assumed we were going to have kind of these normal temperature fluctuation shifts like we saw in the 70s and the 80s, 90s, etc. And where we knew we were going to have just as many strong La Ninas as we were strong El Ninos. I think over a long period of time we would see kelp recover and Sargassum horneri behave more like Sargassum muticum, where it kind of just has its period of the year where it blooms, and but overall it becomes just another background species to the kelp forest story. I think where where it gets tricky to predict is that with climate change, we're expected to see overall warming conditions, and so that's where. Uh, we need better regional models of temperature to get at how persistent sargassum is. Um, one thing that I came across while at, at Moss Landing, and um, I know you're familiar with this as well, Dan, was in Chile, we learned about how there's a section of macrocystis in Peru that has become an annual macrocystis, where it grows, it reproduces, and then it kind of shrinks back to those hold fasts or senescence entirely. And I would be interested um, to know if there was a way we could study the probability of Southern California macrocystis becoming similar to the Peruvian macrocystis to see if maybe in the future we could have this cyclic um, transition of part of the year, it's a very macrocystis heavy dominated forest. And then in another small part of the year, we have a sargassum dominated thicket to see if maybe there's a balance um, rather than it having to be all of one or all of the other. Yeah, it seems like there's so many unknowns with climate change that it's hard to predict, but, but thanks a lot, Anne. Yeah, thanks, Dan. All right. All right, great. It looks like we have one more question out there. Man, I actually feel like a talk show host. So now I'm going to bring up Taylor from a household very familiar to yourself. Taylor, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we're actually not in the same household anymore, unfortunately. But um, uh, Anna, here's my question for you. Um, did you ever think to like look into any community differences between a kelp dominated and a sargassum dominated site? Thanks, Taylor. Well, I actually had another question that I was a little limited on how I could go about it. I wanted to see how after propagation and after that kind of microscopic competition that was happening. Um, is there a difference between survival of macrocystis once it's at that stage, if it's in a sargassum dominated area or a kelp dominated area? And so I did a, a little pilot study looking at, at this very thing. So I collected a bunch of macrocystis juveniles off of um, man-made objects and outside of the conservation areas on Catalina. Um, and I put half of them in a kelp forest and half of them in a sargassum thicket on some polypro line where they couldn't touch each other and just hang out for a couple weeks underwater. And when I pulled them up and looked at how their length and weight compared to before they went in the water, I noticed something interesting. One, that they both no matter where they were, they lost a lot of biomass, but the ones in the sargassum lost less biomass. Um, and I thought that was very strange. So I talked to a couple of my other fellows for studying some different things on the island and one who also um, repeated this study with um, her own plants and she saw the same thing. And one of the other fellows brought up the fact that in um, her studies, which were looking at some of the fish communities, she was noticing different fish were in the kelp forest versus the sargassum thicket. And in particular, the fish that are more herbivorous or are eating the little uh, bryozoans and things on kelp. And so it's potentially that in the sargassum thicket, there's a very different range of creatures. And also at this, the time of year I did this, which was July, there was also a lot more light in the sargassum thicket because the individuals were much smaller than those six foot individuals I showed you in an earlier picture. And so maybe because the kelp forest has a lot more diversity, it's a lot harder for juveniles to stick around. But that means overall there's more organisms that are hanging out in the kelp forest than the sargassum thicket. Um, with this pilot study, this is all I was able to do due to some permitting concerns. And so it, this would definitely be something that if you could redo it on a much bigger scale would be really interesting to explore. So thank you for that question, Taylor. All right, 
Well, we've now come to the end of this. And at this point, I'm going to